myself and Ali have spoken about how our undergraduate degrees, the results weren't great. And we took a lot of that ownership from it, thinking, oh, what did we do wrong? What could we have Nothing. done better? You were done to. People, people are being that? done to. What is, come on, let's, let's dig into this, because this is deep. I would say, structurally, there is something wrong. Eight years of outperformance Down the drain. is gone in three years. So I became really angry that, you know, People are coming in, you know, fantastic A-levels and they're not getting the degree they deserve. I'm really angry about that and angry about the names of eugenicists on our campus yeah. and all that kind of thing. Where I said to the provost from sort of walking in and thinking, well, I'm not going to really be engaged with this nonsense and, you know, this is your problem and not mine. But then when I saw the numbers, I was shocked. Absolutely shocked. If I, as a black woman, was shocked, you can imagine that colleagues who are not black they just don't see it. It became my problem. And then I became quite angry when I saw the awarding gap. You have Chinese students, Indian students outperforming from key stage two, from 11 to A levels, they outperform white students. They get to university, they, they're part of the awarding gap, you know, and then COVID hit and the awarding gap disappeared. When people weren't coming into this toxic environment, <laughs> the awarding gap disappeared. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it, it really sort of, you know, sort of caught me by the throat. <laughs> yeah. STEMinism, the Equity and STEM podcast, sponsored by the Royal Society of Chemistry, where we hold conversations about race representation in STEM with the greatest minds in industry and academia. Hello and welcome to STEMinism, the Equity in STEM podcast, where we hold conversations around race representation and the lack thereof in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My name is Ali Saad. And I'm Clive Sower. And this podcast is brought to you by Vantus STEM and has now been sponsored by the Royal Society of Chemistry. So thank you to them. So... On to today, we have the pleasure of being joined by an esteemed guest. Uh, she is the founder and chief scientific officer of Nanomerix, uh, while also serving as the professor of pharmaceutical nanoscience at the University of College London, where we are today. Previously, pro vice provost for Africa and Middle East, and also the provost envoy for the Race Equality Charter, I believe. She was doing race equality work well before it was a hot topic. So a few accolades. She sits on the various academic boards, such as the governor of the Welcome, uh, governor and trustee of Welcome, and a board member of the Academy of the Medical Sciences. Uh, recently, she has been awarded the position of president at Wolfson College, Cambridge, uh, with her term beginning later this year in 2024. No small deal. She's a designer, inventor, having been listed on, I think I found 11 patents and sits on various editorial boards for research journals, including pharmaceutical nanotechnology. In fact, her groundbreaking work um, won her in 2017 the Royal Society of Chemistry's Emerging Technologies Prize uh, for her work on molecular envelope technology using self-assembling polymer molecules. The credentials are impeccable, I must say. I could keep going. <laughs> In fact, I will briefly. It's no surprise that she won the Royal Pharmaceutical Society's uh, Scientist of the Year Award back in 2012 and the UK DBIS Award for Women of Outstanding Achievement in SET, which is STEM without the M. One of just 25 black female professors in the UK, and I don't have the stat for science, but I bet it is a shocking one, given that there's only 10 black women professors in total. She's a renowned academic author, and her research has helped to inspire many students, myself included. We are joined by Professor Ijeoma Uchegbu. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. Thank you for being here. How are you doing today? Very well indeed, yeah. Thanks very much. Good, good to have you here, and thank you for having us um, at UCL. Um, maybe we'll get straight into it. Um, I think one of the things that always helps kind of set the scene and understanding how 
someone has got through all those amazing accolades is, is understanding where that journey started. So you know you've got some background in Hackney as, as well as Nigeria as well. Can you just tell us a bit about that, um, your, your growing up and what it was like? Yeah, so um, my early years were spent, as you say, in Hackney, yeah, in, in East London, North East London, to be precise. Um, that's where I was born. And I lived there till I was about, I think, 13 years old. Um, very uneventful life. Um, I, I do remember that I went to grammar school. Then I know that the you know, grammar school um, entry was was quite hard to achieve in those days. So I passed the 11 plus, went to a grammar school. And no sooner had I started there when my family decided to move back to Nigeria. So we moved back to Nigeria a few years after the end of the Nigerian Civil War. And the Nigerian Civil War, you probably may not be aware, but over a million children died of starvation. Wow. Um, starvation was used as, as a weapon of war. Um, and, of course, many more children were stunted. So we went back to that um, kind of devastated sort of landscape mm. with um, many, many evidences of the recent ending of the war. I think we went back when the war had ended. It had ended about three years earlier. So wow. there was still, uh, uh, the devastation was very much in evidence. Anyway, um, and then I went to a school with, uh, went to boarding school and it was a bit of a shock because no running water, no electricity at all in that school. So coming from Stoke Newington, where the lights yeah. go on at a flick of a switch, um, water comes out of a tap. This was a huge culture shock. I'd never carried water on my head before, but I had to learn how to do that <laughs> sometimes. And of course, I wasn't very successful and normally ended up drenched. But um, going to Nigeria at that age was, was the very best thing that ever happened to me in my life. It's, it's, and I've often said this, it was pivotal for my development because I moved from a society where there was very little black representation at all. I think I had a black teacher, um, but you don't actually realise that there's no representation. But my, even though I went to a grammar school, and that's why I mentioned it, I didn't see myself as going to university. I was quite happy to go and work in a shop. Oh, wow. That was the extent of my ambition, even though... Most days we had an assembly where people who were going to university were celebrated. And I remember in my class, there were two black girls, even though we were in a... Hackney was a very immigrant community then, mm, yeah. uh, early 70s. Not many, um, most people there were from immigrant stock. So I either, you know, Jewish stock or, or West Indian and a and, and, and few African um, people as well. So even though it was quite diverse, and I've looked at my photograph from my primary school, and, and it is really diverse, probably 50-50, mm. um, black people versus um, white people. But <clears throat> going to grammar school then, really, really in the minority. Mm. Anyway, going to Nigeria, seeing people like me, really just changed my ambition. So I then went to university. I went to university quite early. I was only 16 when I, when I started at university. Wow. And... Um, it was very scary, very frightening, and incredibly misogynistic. Everything that you can imagine um, such, a, such an environment would be like. But still, it was, I think, quite important. After I left university, I really wanted to be a scientist. And I didn't want, I studied pharmacy, but I didn't really want to be a, a community pharmacist. Pharmacy was not very developed in Nigeria. There was not a clear route to a rewarding career. So it wasn't long before I realised that, yeah, I couldn't really do it. I couldn't really become a scientist. I didn't really have equipment. I didn't really have um, a lot of the infrastructure. Chemicals became hard to get. And Nigeria went through a massive restructure in the early 80s when I was, I was then in a university trying to become a scientist. And um, oil revenues dropped you know, I looked at GDP dropped about 15, 20%. Wow. You know, this is crazy, quite difficult. So yeah. lots of structural reorganization. And I started deciding, well, I'd, I'd have to leave. And it coincided with my marriage falling apart. So I came to the UK 
three small children and started doing my PhD as a single mum. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I lived in this area. First of all, I lived in Bayswater uh, in a bed and breakfast for the homeless. And then I moved into a small flat in North London. And then I actually moved to this area. So I was mm. living here in student accommodation. And after, you know, I was studying in this, in, in the School of Pharmacy where we are now. And after doing my PhD, then I went to Glasgow um, for my first lectureship. Um, very excited to go to Glasgow. And I remember my partner at the time sort of went ahead sort of to try and secure accommodation and the rest. And um, and he phoned me and said, do you realise there are no black people here? <laughs> um, and I said, yes, I noticed I that, that when, I, when I went yeah. for interview. Yeah. But uh, went to Glasgow. I uh, had a had a, had another daughter in Glasgow, and then really started my research. And I, you know, began to really love my job. I was mm. bringing money in. I was writing the papers I wanted to write. Um, I was, and I had a quite good a good status at at Strathclyde. Mm. And I must admit, I didn't actually notice that there were no black professors. It's it's really strange that yeah. because we, I'm in the minority in Glasgow, I don't see the big picture. And so I just assume that, well, because I'm in the minority in Glasgow. There's no likely. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that must be different. Yeah. yeah, it must be different elsewhere, you kind of think. Yeah. yeah. So I, I rapidly became a professor, started there in 1997 and was became a professor in 2002. So about, you know, five and a half years uh, to become a professor of, of uh, drug delivery, it was. And... Um, then we sort of started thinking, uh, we had married again by then, had a fourth daughter. Mm. So, you know, um, and then the children were sort of graduating from university and promptly leaving and coming to the southeast. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then it it's really, it, Glasgow is brilliant for friendliness. If you want to, you know, go out into nature, it's, you know, a short drive and you're out in the countryside. It, so, but it rains. It, it's like it's so cold up there as well. It, it, it rains and it's dark in the winter. And yeah. after a while, that does get to you if yeah. you're not from Glasgow yeah. and you don't have yeah. other emotional ties. So we decided to come back here and we both got jobs at the School of Pharmacy and the School of Pharmacy merged with UCL. And then about 10 years ago, we decided to start our company. Mm. So now we... we um, are developing uh, technologies. We have a, a lead technology which allows us to make some medicines that work a lot better than other medicines. So I'll give you an example. We have a pain therapeutic, which should be non-addictive, that we've out-licensed to a company in the United States. They got a $100 million grant to develop it, and they are doing the development as we speak. Incredible. And we then started looking at blindness and trying to look at the diseases uh, associated with blindness. And we found that the technology we had allowed us to get lots of drug into the brain and not to other parts of the body so you wouldn't get side, mm. side effects. And so um, we're developing that and we're going to the clinic with one of our therapies for allergic eye disease. We have another therapy which is aimed at tackling macular degeneration, which is when you have the retina degenerate at the back of the eye. And most people that have that kind of condition will have an injection into the eyeball. Mm. And what we've done is we've been able to make eye drops. Oh, wow. so that Less people, invasive. Yeah, sure. so, so people <laughs> don't have to have the you know injection. I don't know how that that feels having a needle approach Ooh. your eye, but um, people <laughs> do it, people do it. Yeah. And so we um, are developing that as well. So, you know, our company is in North London. It's a very small company. It's the hardest thing I've ever done to actually take technology out of the lab yeah. into the real world is, is incredibly difficult. But yeah, we are, it's also very enjoyable because, you know, you do it because it's almost a vanity project, you know, and, and that's why uh, you do it. Bet you find the passion. There's so many amazing things that you said there, and I want to dig into a whole bunch of them, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, starting at the beginning, why science? What was it about science that, that yeah, you found, you found so, your passion? So that's an interesting story, because when I was very young, about 11, I had a teacher called Miss Gable who... I mean, I was one of those annoying people who became teacher's pet. I didn't start out <laughs> on that journey, but she really took an interest in me and she really encouraged me about my writing. Yeah. She said, you know, 
you could be an author. Imagine being told that at 11. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it had quite, quite a strong effect on me. And I remember I entered a short story competition when I was about 12 or 13. But I got so carried away with the story that I missed the deadline. Mm-hmm. And I kept on writing and writing and writing because I really enjoyed it. So I never, you know, after we left the UK, I forgot about writing and everything and got to Nigeria and the subjects were different. History was different as it should be. The focus of geography was different. English for me was a big bore Mm. because I'd never learned to write English through the rules. And so it was very difficult for me to find that interesting. Mm -hmm. If it sounded right, it was right. Mm. If you're a native speaker. Mm. So I didn't really have much more many places to go the only thing that was common was maths was exactly the same chemistry was exactly the same physics was exactly the same biology was exactly the same so i almost fell into it yeah because the language barrier <laughs> it, 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 it was just a different curriculum so yeah. that was why science had the appeal and i remember when i told my classmates in nigeria that i was going to take physics chemistry and biology and they were like that's these are hard subjects this is very difficult but then I talked some other girls around and they decided to take physics, chemistry and biology as well for wow. their, <laughs> their school certificate. So it just fell into it. Really. Yeah, mm. yeah. Very interesting. I think it's, it's especially when we're in living in a global world now, having that, that experience of two completely different and contrasting environments mm. must be really invaluable now. Um, how has that experience shaped you going forward? And has there been any times when you've been able to tap into those different experiences? So I think, I don't know if you've ever visited any African countries, but if you live in Nigeria, you have many challenges. You have the challenge of a resource light environment where everything is quite difficult to get. That bumps up against the Nigerian psyche, which is one of overconfidence, very loud, very brash, a refusal to admit that there are deficiencies. Mm. And so it's quite a challenging place to live. So if you then manage to achieve anything there, you kind of come here. Like when I first came to the School of Pharmacy, the fact that if I wanted a chemical, I just had to write the word down on a form and it appeared the <laughs> next day, for me, it was amazing. Yeah, because normally I'd have to sort of go from door to door and say, you know, have you got any potassium chloride? Mm. Can you just give me a gram? Mm. And have you got any methanol? Mm. And I remember ordering chemicals in Nigeria and opening them, and they were all fraudulent. They weren't what oh, they what I thought they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you think about having that experience, I didn't find my life here difficult. Mm. Even though I was a single mum and had very little money, I just thought the fact that I can do science, I can do the science and I'm enjoying it, um, it was like a gift. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was just thinking like, you know, the lack of resources on, on, on the other side, on the continent, it's probably, you know... It can really limit the progression for very intelligent people who could go ahead and, and do great things um, just from having lack of access to, to resources. So that's a real shame. Um, but yeah, I guess you came back here and explored your research career career here, which was um, yeah an, a, a really really valuable opportunity. Uh, while this in my mind, you mentioned you did your PhD as a single mom of three, which just I've got a two year old and. You know, I've got a stable two-parent household and it's a lot just like that. We do a lot of things, but... Yeah. Can you, like, maybe comment on... Did you get any support from the institution? Like, well, I'm just that, trying to think if there was an inter- any inter- equity. That's <laughs> an interesting one because when I first came, I hid it from my supervisor. Okay. Because I thought that he would consider me to be completely unserious, not able to do the job. And I also thought it's none of your business. You know, this is my business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I hid it. And then it popped out one day as an anecdote. You know, you talk about your children. Mm. And and, it, and he was shocked. Mm. He was like, your daughter, where does your daughter live? And I said, oh, my daughters live with mm. me. <laughs> but the thing is, once he knew, 
he couldn't have been more supportive. Yeah. He, he was incredibly supportive once he discovered that I had this family. And I had, I did have challenges around accommodation and financing. And each time he would offer me a solution, you know, if I didn't have enough. I remember once I did all the math and you know, by the time I paid for the childcare, the nursery and all that, you know, there was actually no money for groceries. It was negative. Wow. And I went to him and I said, well, I need to get another job. And he said, you've got a full-time mum full-time PhD student you can't be three full times <laughs> how much do you need and I sort of said well I need this and I need that and he said okay I'll give you a small job to do at home where you sort of find some references for me and I'll pay you this extra bit so you don't have to and I tell that story because it's very important for people to ask for help mm. when you are faced with those kind of challenges um and 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 he just couldn't do enough I remember when I had to travel for a conference, the first time I left my children with my sister and, and they looked after, um, my, my sister and her husband looked after my children. But it was always juggling, always rushing about. And, you know, I used to be very strict about the time I left, had to leave to pick up my daughter from the childminder, pick up the other children, you know, just had to be really strict about the way I managed my time. You couldn't go out in the evening. You have to sacrifice that kind of thing. If you go out on a weekend, it's a big crowd of us all going yeah. out, you know, so <laughs> you have to look for cheap places and go yeah. to the park a lot. Yeah. And, and at that time, actually, museums weren't free in London. Oh, wow. That's a recent innovation. Oh, okay. wow. And I remember the Natural History Museum ha was free, I think, after 5.30 for like an hour. And you'd often see people just sitting there waiting, waiting for 5.30 yeah. to sort yeah. of jump in. It's very different now that museums are well supported and they are free and it's, it's, it's fabulous. Um, so you just, you just juggle. It was not that easy. But also, I never once thought, you know, gosh, if I was back in Nigeria where I had two cars and two maids, I would have a great life. Mm -hmm. No, because I was so keen to get away, mm -hmm. if you get my point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as it's International Women's Month, I think that 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 story hits home that that little bit more. And I think there's there's loads of women that go through similar trials and tribulations. Mm. It sounds like you had a great ally and, and mentor, which is which is key as well. But also that that asking for help. I think sometimes we take on too much until the point is it's unbearable. But sometimes when you when you do get that support and you find out it's there, that can be the the difference that helps you get through. Yeah, I mean when you know, sort of leaving Nigeria, just sort of hard to get your career going. But socially, there's lots of fun happening. There's lots of people around, you know. And so you, you sort of have to leave that behind. And you come here and it can be quite lonely when you first come. And you do, you know, I had my sister, my brother. So, you know, wasn't completely lonely. But you do then decide, OK, I know why I've made this 5,000 mile trip this is what I want so you kind of you're, you're really focused on it because you've given up quite mm, a bit yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to be to, here yeah to, absolutely to be there yeah so after all, all of the sacrifice all the travelling the, the many accolades that we've heard what would you say is your your proudest achievement um, or, or what's had the, the greatest impact so far well definitely uh, you know being elected president of Wilson College Cambridge is up there with, you know, a big moment for me and and, and I'm really looking forward to, to starting at Wolfson in the autumn. Um, very, very happy to sort of, you know, be, be chosen by the fellowship to lead them, um, you know. The, it's it's by elections. You just never know what's going to happen mm. until the very last minute, because you definitely cannot speak to all the electorates. So you know, really, really, that's up there. But actually, my proudest moment was when I became a professor, mm. because when I came to the UK with those three children, you know, now my daughters are all grown up. They're all in fantastic jobs. You know, a couple of them earn more than I do at UCL. <laughs> wow. you know, that's that's just life. Isn't yeah. it? You know, and uh, but they're still broke. <laughs> every time cost so, of living crisis. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's that's really really fabulous. But I think when we when we arrived, the oldest was eight, the youngest was one, wow. and I had five hundred pounds in my pocket, and I just thought, well, if I just happen to survive, I'm doing really great. I never thought I'd become a professor. So mm. 
actually, when it was confirmed that my professorship bid had been successful, I think that was a real big moment for me. You know, I felt felt very, very pleased, very happy, very pleased that my reviewers had looked at the work and felt that it was worthy. Yeah, it was that I think that was it. I think uh, at the time you would have been even fewer of the of the represented black prof- black professors as well, which is interesting, and yeah. de- definitely in Scotland. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I don't even know if there was a, a woman professor in STEM mm-hmm. yeah. before that one, but I, you know, I haven't looked at the data. But mm-hmm. so maybe whilst we're on the the topic of PhDs, um, can we get can we maybe get a bit technical? I think Ali, actually, you're you're studying advanced advanced biomaterials. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Do you want to do want to gain some Yeah, I was just uh, learning about different medications that you can take in the eye and some of the improvements in that area, some of the materials being used. But the work that you did on um, peptides crossing the the blood brain barrier was, yeah, I mean, seminal to the field. But um, can you maybe just uh, discuss what the topic of your PhD was and um, and also g- generally like. What do you think are some valuable outcomes of doing a PhD? Because a lot of people ask me, should I do a PhD? Should I do an MBA? Mm. Um, they're not really sure which way is the best way to go. So Yeah, so my PhD was all about using, again, nanotechnology for oncology. Mm-hmm. So as you probably know, if you've known anyone that's been had a cancer diagnosis and then had to go through chemotherapy, chemotherapy is essentially you know, a sort of poisoning of the body and hoping that the cancer cells, because they are more active, will be more poisoned than other areas. We do have monoclonal antibodies now, and these are more targeted and specific. But if you have a small molecule drug uh, as a chemotherapy drug, the side effects are huge. So my PhD was all about trying to shift the therapeutic away from healthy tissue towards the tumor tissue and, and using nanotechnology. And we published a few papers. It was very, very interesting. It's, it's an incredibly crowded field. And we have some now after, I think it was about the whole, the whole field sort of started around uh, 1970s, I think, something like that, or 65. And then we got the first therapeutic in 1995 using these, these concepts. So it t- took a very long time to get there. Um and that was my PhD, but I don't work on, although having said that, I still work on trying to get the drug to disease tissue and away from healthy tissue. Mm, yeah. you know? so, so with our eye drop, we can deliver to the eye and we don't want anything in the blood to go to the other parts mm-hmm. of the body. And that, that's one of the key benefits yes. of our technology. Mm. Um, I still work on that, but uh, less with uh, needles and intravenous injections and more with giving things by mouth and trying to make them work or through the eye or through the nose mm-hmm. and through the nose to the brain that's some somewhere that we've we've really sort of carved out our own niche that we can do that repeatedly and we can do it in a way that we have very little in the blood going to other areas and most of it you know a large proportion going to the brain so that's sort of the outcome of working in that area. Then when you think about a PhD, I think that if you want to do independent research and you want to create new knowledge, it's a great training ground. You don't need it to create new knowledge, but it's a way of going into something with the rules established so you can learn the rules And so that you have a bit more confidence when you see something new, that actually this is new. Because a lot of the times if you, and this was how I felt, when I was doing experiments and I saw an observation, I would go and read and see who had seen that before. And Mm. if nobody else had seen it, I wouldn't have the confidence Mm, to know that I'm the first person to see it. Then I'd go to my supervisor and say, well, that's unusual. That's never been, and then I'd feel a bit more confident. So it gives you a sort of environment in which to be able to have the confidence to say, I'm I'm going to create new knowledge because when I see something new, I will know it because I've been there before and I've been there in a more controlled environment. Some people, I guess, are super confident, super brilliant that, you know, they can just walk in without even a degree and, and understand that, well, I know that what I've discovered here is brand new, 
Yeah. You know, fair dues to them. <laughs> but the majority of us are not like that. That's and we right. sort of need to have the training. And so that's what a PhD does for you. And it allows you then to have a research career in, in, in various areas, whether it's industry, in academia. You know, you, you can really have a, a nice research career if you decide, right, you're going to do a PhD. And also employers will use that as a shorthand yeah. for being um, disciplined, yeah. being able to plan your work, design your experiments if you're in STEM or pursue a piece of independent study if you are in the arts. So I think PhDs are useful if you are interested in research. Mm -hmm. And I must say this, I think if you have a research career, there's never a dull moment. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely fabulous that you can go to bed, wake up in the morning, think about something, come to the lab, try it out, get million pounds in to fund it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly your idea that you had in the shower or while you were having your coffee has its own momentum. Yeah. There are very few professions where you can do that. That is quite magical. And, and it's, I think if you are interested in never having a boring day, not that all days are not good. I mean, in the early days when my papers were rejected, I would sob mm -hmm. for a while mm -hmm. before I could, you know, recover. Um, but I probably don't sob anymore if my papers are rejected. But that's <laughs> there are bad days when your papers are rejected, your grants are rejected, every your the job you applied for you're rejected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to you needed a bit of resilience to pursue a research career. But I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Mm. I love that. I love that. And on the theme of rejection as well, and we, we know you've done a lot of work in the equity in higher education and also with the, the Royal Society of Chemistry. One of the things that we've looked at is the intersectionality and almost the, the, double, the, the double challenges that are faced um, by, by black women. Can you speak about um, what your experience has been and um, how you've found mentors whether they look like you or not, and, and what, what, your, what the challenges have been or the, the mm. barriers, as it were. So I think in the beginning of my career, I and I think that, that again is coming from Nigeria where there's this overinflated confidence where, you know, you just feel that, yeah, I'll give it a go and see what happens. Um, it doesn't always work out. But um, I think in the beginning, like I said, I wasn't really aware that the numbers were as bad as they are. Mm. So... You know, I'm in Glasgow where there are no black people and I'm progressing. And so I just assume that this is what's going on. And then um, I did have mentors. I had a nice professor, Clive Wilson, in, in, in Glasgow, who sort of took me under his wing and introduced me to people in industry so I could get industry contacts. And that was, they, that was very, very nice. And we published some papers together, did some work together. And that was really nice. My PhD supervisor definitely was always batting for me uh, when I was here as a student, you know, making sure that those life issues, he could try and help me solve them. Um, so I had, I did have people that I felt I could look up to and ask questions. And there was another uh, colleague of mine, Martin Davis, who sort of said, you need to apply for grants from, from the research councils. And I thought, oh, OK, if you say I can, why not? And, and then I you know, started getting grants. And actually, that little conversation just in the corridors of a conference led to my work being funded. Now, it's, since 1999, I've had unbroken funding from the EPSRC since 1999. I'm coming to the end of, you know, one of my grants now. But since that time, you know, it was a quarter of a century of unbroken funding. And that's just someone in the corridor saying, why don't you apply? I was um, on the panel and I saw what people were writing. And I think your work, you know, could, could get funding. So though I've had mentors like that. Um, and then talking about the race equality work, I was race equality envoy at, at UCL. I stepped down in 2021. I found it incredibly exhausting, but also very rewarding. Yes, is, yeah. But after a while, I think emotionally, you've kind of given as much as you can give mm. because every time you stand up and talk about it, there is a little voice in your head saying, I, I bet you think I'm not up to the job because of, of, of who I am. And, and, and after a while you sort of have to leave the space. But, um, 
when I, how did I get involved in it? I was asked to come and be part of the Race Equality Charter self-assessment team. And I was, you know, pretty pissed off. And, you know, why, why, why are you asking me to get involved in this? <laughs> surprise, surprise. I'm not a sociologist, you know, and I'm not a, an equity expert. I'm, you know, a scientist doing my work. And my work's going very well, thank you. So I really don't want to be distracted. But the provost <laughs> asked and um, I couldn't actually say no because I didn't have the courage to say no to my boss's boss's boss. So I went to the first meeting thinking, I'll just sit at the back, I'll mess about and... Um, They probably won't call me back again because they can see I'm not engaged. But then when I saw the numbers, I was shocked, Mm. absolutely shocked. And I tell this to people because if I, as a black woman, was shocked, you can imagine Mm. that colleagues who are not black, they just don't see it. Mm -hmm. So I was really shocked when I saw the numbers. And then I became quite angry when I saw the awarding gap, for example, because my daughter had gone to UCL. And in fact, now I've had two of my daughters. One did an undergraduate bachelor's degree at UCL, what the other one did a master's degree at UCL. So I became really angry Mm -hmm. that, you know, people are coming in, you know, fantastic A-levels and they're not getting the degree they deserve. I mean, my, my daughter did get a good degree, but really angry about that and angry about the names of eugenicists on our campus yeah. and all that kind of thing. And I just, I just what I said to the proverbs from sort of walking in and thinking, well, I'm not going to really be engaged with this nonsense. And, you know, this is your problem and not mine. <laughs> it became my yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I That's asked the provost for a role. I said, I want a senior role in this space because I think I can do some good. And he hummed and hard, and then he gave me a role, and I said, I want to be paid for the role. Then he hummed and hard, and then he gave me a tiny supplement on my salary to do the role. And then I, you know, worked with the Race Equality Steering a Group. This is like a staff network. And we went into all the leadership teams, and I said, this is your data. It's not looking good. What are you going to do about it? These are the things you can try because they, they've been tested and they work. And we did this for a few years. We called it the Dean's Roadshow. We went to the deans, went to heads of departments of the professional services teams. And gradually we began to see the numbers tick up for black and minority ethnic people employed in senior roles, because that's my that's my barometer. There's no point saying we've got more into the university. It's about 18% in UCL then of the staff were from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, but only about 10% were in the senior grades. So we worked and worked, and by the time I stepped down, we had 12% in the senior grades. And considering the fact that we've got 12,000, you know, Mm, staff at UCL, these are a lot of people. Um, We went round and talked about the awarding gap. There was an awarding gap team. They got some funding. Um, And, you know, I led that work, walking around just and saying to people that, it's your problem too. It's not about fairness. It's not about social justice. It's about the added value that you provide to the students. It is about securing and retaining talent. And actually, if our mission is to add value to students and students come in and they don't get the degree they deserve, we have subtracted from them, which happens. It happens, and unless it's stopped, the last time I looked at the data, you have Chinese students, Indian students outperforming from key stage two, from 11 to A levels, they outperform white mm. students. They get to university, they, they're part of the awarding gap. Oh, eight, years of, yeah. eight years of outperformance Down is gone in three years. You have black pupils at key stage one exactly the same as white pupils. They start to fail earlier. By the time we get to A levels, they've already started failing. By the time we get to university, the awarding gap you know, could be as as high as 15% in the sector. So you do think to yourself, well, this is a structural issue which needs to be addressed. And, um, yeah, it it really sort of, you know, sort of caught me by the throat (laughs) what was happening. And so... And we went and you've what we found is that we found some faculties year on year, the awarding gap would fall, um, you know, and then COVID hit and the awarding gap disappeared. Mm-hmm. When people weren't coming into this toxic environment, really <laughs> the awarding gap disappeared. Oh, wow. And That's then we, super interesting. we fought for 15 months to get rid of the names of eugenicists on our buildings. Um, a long fight. It had to be that long because we had to hear all opinions. 
Um, but in the end, the point was clearly made that when this pseudoscience was first broached, it was challenged in its day. So it's not a question of this was the predominant thinking. It was challenged in its day. Yeah. It's clearly pseudoscience because genetically there is no difference that Absolutely. you can point to. Uh, race is a social construct. Mm -hmm. um, it has its roots in God knows where from, from the 1700s. And so we made the case and we started out 50-50. Some saying, I don't think you should take off the names. These were really illustrious people who developed blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. By the time we got to the end, even though as a group, so we, we, as a group we fell out, we all agreed that the names should be removed. Okay. <laughs> got there in the end, yeah, which is yeah. the important yeah. thing and went about it the right way as well, which yeah. I think we've, I think we, there was statues that were toppled here, there and yeah. everywhere. Yeah. In Bristol, yeah, yeah. what should yeah. happen, yeah. That's really interesting. I think what you said, we, myself and Ali, have spoken about how our undergraduate degrees, the results weren't great. And we took a lot of that ownership from it, thinking, oh, what did we do wrong? What mm -hmm. could we have Nothing. done better? You were done to. People, people are being done that? to. What is, come on, let's, let's dig into this, because this is deep. This is deep. What is under that? So there's no, there's no silver bullet. Yeah. There's no one sitting there saying, I'm not going to award degrees that they deserve. Uh -huh. But there is a real, I would say, structurally, there is something wrong. With the education system itself? Or? Across the board, definitely. Because you can't have black children and white children performing the same at key stage two at 11, and then gradually mm. things go, go yeah. awry. Mm. So there, there must be quite a lot going on. I mean, I have theories around looking around you and just seeing anytime there is a, it's, it's less now, anytime there's black representation in the media, for every positive story, there's six negative yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there is a, there is a negate, almost a negation of the self mm. taking place every single time. We talk to students and ask them, how can we change classroom culture? And some of the, one of the things the students said, which was very simple and, and very clear, was that I would like, I come in with a name like Ijeom Ruchegu and God Almighty, people look at it and think, well, what, where do I start? Yeah. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I don't want to offend this person. So what they do is that they just ignore me. They ignore me for the full lesson. They ask Anne to contribute. They ask Claire to contribute. But they just don't want to embarrass me, so they just ignore me. And the student said, instead of doing that, just say, what was your name again? What was your name again? How do I say your name? It, that is preferable. It's inclusive. To being um, ignored. We also have issues around the material that students are asked to study, reading lists, not being inclusive, not being diverse enough to, you know, really stretch people's imagination, make, they, make them feel as if they, they have ownership in the course, especially in the arts and humanities. And, and the role, the, 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 the sort of introduces and originators of most of the scientific concepts come from one particular group. Mm -hmm. So I make it, a, in my lectures, I have two very small um, things I say. I talk about a Pakistani surgeon called Ayub Omaya, who invented a way to deliver drugs to the brain in children. Mm -hmm. And I mention that he's a Pakistani surgeon. Mm -hmm. And the students look up. Mm, who, suddenly. <laughs> who, and, and think, oh my goodness. And I also mention a Raman spectroscopy yeah, coming yeah. from an Indian scientist um, and these are, these are just, these are the tiny ones I could find, but I mentioned them and I would not probably talk about James Watson mm -hmm. and, 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 and DNA. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, you sort of have summarized what you think are some of the key barriers to, to black people and also other, other minorities um, entering and maintaining. And uh, I sort of summarized that as being a lack of role models, maybe a lack of stories, uh, a lack of perspectives that are from anyone other than the race that they come from. Well, you've sort of alluded to it briefly, um, but what are some of the benefits then of having diverse and inclusive workforces, um, and also academic um, staffing boards? So um, there's lots of evidence that 
around now, lots of evidence in the literature that says if you have diversity of thought, you have better decisions. This evidence comes from juries. Diverse juries tend to focus on the facts of the case and the evidence before coming to a conclusion. Um, diverse groups trying to um, pre present products to their customers tend to be more innovative mm -hmm. because they know different pockets of the customers and they can bring that learning into any decision about a new product. And this is all published literature. There is also literature around citations of scientific papers. If you have people from different countries, they tend to get more cites mm, yeah. because across the border, maybe now they are coming up with a solution that is more broadly applicable. Mm. Um, and there is another piece of work by someone called Brad Greenwood, and that is a paper published in PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, where he looked at a million births and looked at those a million births and looked at neonates that were struggling, four week old up to zero to four weeks, who had various health complications and looked at their survival based on their care and based on the matching of races and found that if a of black... The carer. The, yeah, the oh. carer and the, and the, and the okay, child. Okay, yeah, yeah. And they, he found that if a black physician was looking after a black child, that child was half as likely to die. Half? Wow. Whereas if a white physician was looking after that child, the, the child was twice as likely to die. So it's all about life and death here, literally. Yeah. It is a matter of life and death. So, so it's not about social justice and just fairness, uh -huh. that everybody should have equal opportunities. It's not about that. It is about making sure you're delivering a good service, a service which is fit for purpose. If it's in the clinic, it's a service that's fit, fit for purpose. If you're in a jury, it's a service fit for purpose, et cetera, et cetera. And McKinsey has done a lot of work on this, looking at the ethnic minority representation on senior boards and found more profitability follows more ethnicity mm -hmm. on those boards. So it is about offering the very best service the opposite of that is, of course, if you don't have representation and you have inequality and you have inequality in society because certain people can't access certain jobs, can't access certain jobs, and so they are paid a lot less, what you find is that inequality like that is associated with societal ills. Mm -hmm. There's a direct correlation between income inequality in countries and the level of obesity, mm -hmm. homicides, incarceration, mental illness. Mm -hmm. These are things that you cannot say, well, I'm not going to get obese because I'm rich or I'm not going to be mentally ill because I'm rich or my relatives won't be incarcerated sure. because I'm rich. So these are things. And actually, because I'm so rich, I can't really go around with my Philip Patek watch and my Rolex because I'm going to get mugged yeah, exactly. from the people that are not rich. Yeah. So if you live in an unequal society and an inequality comes from having discriminatory attitudes, it harms everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's about giving the best service you can and living in the best society that you can. That's deep. There's like a, a very clear business case that you can use to approach different companies. But then the, am the amount of savings in tax that we would spend on the healthcare system just based on what you've, what you've discussed there is astronomical. Yeah, it's, the the social justice aspect is important because I think it does inspire people to get into doing this work. But yeah, it sounds like the case that you've touched on is 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 particularly strong. The thing about the social justice arg argument is that if someone feels I just have to do it so that I appear fair, but I might lose, I might have to pay more tax, mm. then they're not going to get involved. But if they're doing it because they don't want to be mugged. Mm -hmm. When they go <laughs> go clubbing, makes a then difference. You're, they're probably more likely to want to get involved. That's that's a, a, a really interesting point. I think it it adds to the reasoning why it's not just about emotions. I think one of my favorite expressions is "men lie, women lie, but numbers don't." And yeah. and when the data is there, it makes it makes it almost irrefutable. So that's a really insightful approach. Uh, maybe switching tracks a bit. Mm. You've had uh, a phenomenal career, both in industry and academia. And I think 
often people have to choose whether they do one or the other. Um, how have you been able to kind of weave between the two and how, how can we bring the two closer together to help bring that equity around as well? Yeah, so I wouldn't class myself as being in both camps, really. I mean, my little industry, let's describe it as that, is a micro company, which is only set up to try and forward the technologies that I'm interested in. Um, it's, I found that incredibly hard. I, it's, it's very difficult. The only thing that stops me having a good night's sleep is worrying about nanomerics and where nanomerics mm. is going next. <laughs> But it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done because I remember sort of drawing the molecule that we're now putting into the clinic in my notebook, wow. designing it and mm. thinking, how am I going to make it? So, so it's incredibly rewarding. I think if you, the work I'm doing in both camps is, is broadly similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's broadly similar. I think if you really enjoy your work, you you go wherever the work has to go. Mm. And, and, and I, I couldn't think of doing anything which didn't involve, you know, sort of trying to create new knowledge, trying to be involved in doing something that nobody else has done. It gives you a huge buzz. Um, and even when things don't work, it makes you understand, okay, um, I still have to do a lot more work here because I don't quite understand it. Mm. So it sort of almost gives you another opportunity to try in, in a way. Mm. So the way I've been able to sort of work in both areas is because I'm doing something that I really, really love. Um, yeah. And and so it's it's a little bit easier, but it is, it, nanomerics is hard. Yeah. I mean, you can tell the passion is demonstrated just in the way you talk and the way you talk about it. But I'm always incredibly inspired to see like black company leaders and your chief scientific officer of Dynamics as well as co-founder. And what I what I wonder is like, I feel like there is insufficient resources to develop black leaders. And I wonder if you have any thoughts or comments on that. And I, I wonder like if this is something that's really really missing from the coaching or mentoring space uh, you know it seems like these things are more accessible to other groups of people i just wonder mm. if you have any thoughts on that i mean if you look at the data um on on women leading companies or or or, or, or black people leading companies mm. yes you're, you're probably right um i think women get very little amounts of funding for example for their ideas um and and i would i haven't seen the data on black or asian leaders of companies and co-founders but i i would imagine it's that you have you have similar <laughs> issues but i think the way to i think we should ask for mentoring help you know mm. if we if we're thinking about doing something new that we've never done before it's always good to ask for help and mm. and and definitely i mean I work with my husband in nanomerics, but we're constantly asking people, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Because we're both academics um, and that's worked for us. So seeking out some help is quite important. I would love to see a situation where a company, and I think Google has a black talent thing mm. that they mm. do where they offer people small amounts of money and some mentoring if they're in the tech space yeah. and if they're from ethnic minority backgrounds. So I would love to see that rolled out mm. and more people doing things like that. And the Broadening Horizons Royal Society of Chemistry program, Royal Society of Chemistry Broadening Horizons program is about trying to get ethnic minority people into the chemical sciences industries as well. So I'd love to see more of that mm. and, and people taking advantage of it. Into is impossible, and then we need to then break the that that supposed glass ceiling where we can never be leaders in companies. So yeah, I think both both um, approaches are, are mm. really important. Mm. Um, so I think you touched on it briefly around the the importance of networking and how a, a conversation in the corridor led to I think it was almost twenty five years of, of funding. Can you speak to the importance of networking and maybe any networks that you've used or tapped into um, in your career? Yeah, so um, in nanomerics, you, we, we have to do a lot of business development and, and business development really means going and talking, talking at people about your technology, you know, really trying to push it. 
And what we've noticed is that, you know, actually for you to be taken seriously, you people have to see you again and again and again and know that you're still around and you're still, you're making progress. And I tend to go to these partnering meetings where you do a little bit of speed dating with people you've, you've arranged meetings with, but you also have a lot of social events where you have to go and talk to people, you know, just, just a drink in hand and just have a chit chat about things. And I remember those, I used to find it quite daunting to sort of go into a space where I don't know anyone. And, you know, this is not an academic space fairly in in my own area of academia I'm reasonably well known so if I go in I'd always see someone I know to chat to and it's so easy but then walking into the in the early days walking into the more business oriented space didn't know anyone and I remember going to a sort of uh, uh, preparatory meeting and one guy said what you do when you walk into those spaces is you find the person who's alone at a table standing there or sitting and you go and sit with that alone person you have a conversation that lasts about five to seven minutes with that person and you're warmed up. Now you're able to tackle the group of six that mm. are throwing their head back laughing and, and you're able to go in there and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. And so now, of course, I don't find it as daunting to do that because I've done it many times. But that was my sort of way of, of trying to overcome a more personal sort of, oh my God, it's not, it's not that I don't want to talk to people, but I have to introduce myself to all these new people. And, and actually when I started going to those places, of course I'm the only black woman there. Mm. And, and, and some of them, I'm the only black person. It's a bit different now, a few years um, down, the, down the line. But um, a lot of, and I remember once I was in a particular space and two people walked in and talked to me and they sort of, they, they were from Australia and they almost like, oh my God. Well, this is most unexpected. So you tend Sounds to offensive. You, yeah. Well, you know, they didn't say they didn't say anything. The whole body language yeah, was gave it away. Acute to. surprise. Yeah. So I, t- you know, you tend to use humor to sort of talk to people and everything like that. And that that networking is vital, absolutely vital, because without it, your products or your technology just won't be there. You have to, so it has to be in people's faces, you know, so that they can see it, they can understand what you're doing and they may not understand it the first time, but by the time they see you the sixth time, they've got a clear view, ah, this is what you're doing. So it's absolutely vital. I didn't find it easy in the beginning. It's a bit easier for me now. And I remember one a person from my company went to one of those meetings the first time and I gave her the same advice. Go to the cocktail party, the mixer event and talk to the person that's sitting on their own. And she went to one of those events and then met someone who they had some follow-up. And I said, there you go. You see, it works. Yeah, warm yourself up. I like that. This has been a a really, really great experience. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. I think we've maybe got time for one last question. Okay. No problem. So um, I've heard you say uh, when when doing research for this that uh, barriers are made to be broken. Mm. So if you had uh, unlimited resources, time and money, and you could do something today to make a big difference in the uh, equity space in STEM, what would it be? And who would you target? So what I, I think what really works quite nicely is when people come face to face with people they've never had to mix with so if you are in a space where you know a whole bunch of people who have never seen a black woman academic um I think that we both learn a lot from that Mm. interaction Mm -hmm. those chit chats what I would do is is set up a scheme where an ethnic minority students have a chance to work with board level, C-suite level people and just, um, I wouldn't say so much be mentored by them, but even just sit with them and have a conversation. The conversation doesn't have to be about, well, how can I be in the Mm C-suite? It can be about, tell me about your life and I'll tell you about mine. Mm -hmm. Because I would tell those experiences will be so different that both parties will learn quite a lot from it. One thing that 
if you're from an ethnic minority background, you will learn is that even when you look the part, it's still not plain sailing. Sure. There is, it's still hard to achieve. Mm-hmm. And one thing the person that has achieved that may, in some people's view, look the part will learn from this very young person is how steep the journey is, how walking uphill it really is for this young person. Because if you understand that it's not a level playing field, and I know that's a cliche, that some people literally have to walk uphill with their legs amputated, Mm -hmm. then I think it gives you a better perspective when they appear before you. And they're not quite the, they're not, uh, let's just say someone appears before you, but they're not quite polished. They're dropping their consonants. Mm -hmm. They're talking with their hands like I am. Mm -hmm. But then you understand that person's from a different background, had to overcome quite a bit to get to where they are. And so if they want to go further, and so I'm thinking about, you know, me, I don't know, in my early 30s, you know, telling people, yes, I had to carry water on my head, you know. And gosh, it's so different from where I am. I think it gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Really powerful, really powerful. Just thinking about a younger version of you carrying water on your head to now the president of the of the Wolfson mm. College. It's a really inspiring story and, and shows that, yeah, anything is possible when, when you have that belief and when there are systems and when there are opportunities. And when there are people to help you. That's right. Mm. Allyship is key. Allyship right. is key. So many things we wanted to touch on, but unfortunately we are out of time. Well, it was a pleasure <laughs> speaking to you both. One thing we like to do here is give people their, their flowers whilst they're still here. So this lovely cactus oh, is where we are is for you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> we also have a gift from the Motherland Market, our sponsors, uh, oh, for you to fabulous. take home there. Um, oh. So thank you very much for... Thank you. I didn't think I'd get a goodie bag. That's good. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Exactly. So thank, yeah, thank you, so you much. very much for, for, for all me. you do. And it's oh, been yeah. a pleasure. Until next time. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Um, I've been Ali Saad. I've been Clive Sower. And we've been with Professor Giomo Chegbu. This is the Steminism Podcast. See you in two weeks.